Looking at Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. Zechariah 5, 5. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the ephah going forth. And again he said, This is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Then he said, This is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there were two women were coming out of the wind. And the wind was in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, Where are they taking the ephah? Then he said to me, To build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. Quite a story. But what does it mean, and how does it relate to the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation draws on this passage very heavily in chapter 18. We have four essential elements in this story. The first is the term Shin'ar. Shin'ar is the first. Shin'ar in Hebrew means tooth of a city tooth of a city. A strange name indeed. It comes from the Hebrew letter Shin. Shin from the Hebrew alphabet. But Shin is also the name of tooth. Tooth. If you look at the letter it resembles teeth. It resembles dentition. Resembles teeth. Shin. Shin ar. Shin, tooth, ear, tooth of a city. They're going to Shinar. First element is Shinar. What is Shinar? Turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, chapter 1. In Daniel 1, we read the following. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a type of the Antichrist and the figure of the devil, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Notice the word treasury. Zechariah's name has to do with the treasury of Yahweh. When Jerusalem fell in 585-586 BC, the treasuries of God were taken to Babylon. Zechariah was interested in the restoration of the treasuries. Again, Zechariah is showing us what is happening in the heavenlies. At the same time, Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah are showing us what's happening on earth. Here is the emphasis on the treasuries. Zechariah is interested in the restoration of the treasures of God to his people, to his house. But the people go into the captivity and the treasures of God are taken to the land of Shinar. This is the Babylonian captivity. Shinar means the region around Babylon. Shin, ear, tooth of a city. Babylon was the name of the city and the empire named after the city. But the region around the city is in Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers come together, forming a delta 
flowing southward towards Basra, as it is called today, and what is known as the Sha'at al arab at the northern head of the Persian Gulf. If you look at the Shin, looking at it upside down as if it were a map flowing southward, it looks like a delta. It looks like the delta where Babylon was located, where the Tigris and Euphrates converge and begin branching off for tributaries that go into the Sha'at al-Arab. Hence, we can identify Shin'ar with Babylon, absolutely and unequivocally. We know what it is. The city is Babylon, but the tooth of the city is Shin'ar, geographical convergence. Haven't found that in any commentary, but it's the best I can see why it's called that. Well, let's understand this further. That's where the treasuries go. We saw in our previous teaching that Babylon represents, going back to Semiramis and to Nimrod, the merger of false religion with corrupt government and corrupt economy. A corrupt economic system, a corrupt human government, and a corrupt false religious system Converging, this is Babylon, having its Old Testament climax in the Babylonian Empire, continuing into the New Testament via Pergamum into the Greco Roman world, but ultimately all of it, all of it pointing towards Babylon the Great. The way that Judah went into the Babylonian captivity is a picture of the way the people of God will go into Babylon the Great at the end of the age. It will be swallowed up into the false religious and corrupt political system. That is what underlies the ecumenical movement today. It's what underlies the interfaith movement. It's what underlies Rick Warren's global peace plan. We have to unite with people who worship other gods, even though Paul and Moses identifies them as demons. The coming together of the world's false religions with a political and an economic agenda. Some people relate this to the New World Order, etc. I don't want to deviate into anything that can resemble conspiracy theories, but we have to look at what the Bible says and what is transpiring in light of what the Word of God says. You do have this emergence of Babylon the Great, and religion is central to it. Again, the European agenda needs to reverse the Reformation to bring about an artificial union in continental Europe in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies of making the iron stick to the clay. And so it becomes. The church will go into the Babylonian captivity of Babylon the Great, just as Judah did. But something happened with Judah in 585 when it went to Babylon. In 721, the ten northern tribes of the north went into the Assyrian captivity. Up until that time, up until the time of Jeremiah, the people had the idea that we're the true Hebrews, we're the true house of David, we're the faithful Israelites. It was those ten northern tribes in Israel up north because of Ahab and Jezebel and those who followed them. Wicked kings like Jeroboam, they're the ones who were unfaithful Israel. They went into the captivity of Assyria, but were the faithful ones, were the house of David. That was their thinking. There's the true Israel and there's the corrupt Israel. Anybody who was from the ten northern tribes who remained faithful to God came south to Judah and joined the tribes of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin and some of the Levites during the revivals of kings like Asa, the good people from the north came south. Well, up until 30, 35 years ago, this was the thinking of what we would call born-again Christians or evangelicals. The true church, the true believers, are the ones who are born again. It's the evangelical churches and denominations who are the true body of Christ. The World Council of Churches, liberal Protestants, the Church of Rome, Eastern Orthodoxy, the cults, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're the false church. 
were the true one. Judah became as bad and even worse than Israel. In the last days, evangelicism becomes as corrupt as the false religion of the world. At one time, when born-again Christians said things like Babylon, or the apostate church, or the harlot church, it was understood as a popular Christian colloquialism that we were talking about Roman Catholicism, or about the World Council of Churches, or something that was obviously apostate. Now, we are talking about mainstream evangelicism in many cases. You've got mainstream evangelicals following Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan. You get in bed with the Pope, the Pope is in bed with the Dalai Lama. You've got people in evangelical churches doing yoga. You've got people advocating Buddhist spirituality who claim to be born again. It's getting more and more like this. There's a tend towards universalism. There was a book written by a deceiver called Peter Kreeft. Kreeft said Mohammed was in heaven, Buddha was in heaven. He saw them, in the, there was a vision they were in heaven. And in this book he argues we must have ecumenical union with Islam to morally redeem society. That book was endorsed on the cover by deceivers and religious liars like Chuck Colson and J.I. Packer. Major evangelical figures endorsed the book saying to unite with Islam to save the world morally. Judah became as bad or worse than Israel. Evangelicism becomes as bad or worse than the World Council of Churches, the Vatican, etc. The televangelists, the money preachers, people like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, Benny Hinn, Jesse Duplantis, Joyce Meyer, these wicked people who perverted the gospel of Jesus have made born again a household joke. And pastors, knowing it's wrong, did not protect the sheep from these wolves because the pastors were hirelings. All you have is a faithful remnant in the developed world of evangelicals. In fact, God is turning his grace from the developed world to the developing world. The real growth of biblical Christianity is in the third world now, for the most part. Ultimately, God will turn his grace back to Israel and the Jews. The time of the Gentiles will come to a close. Mainstream Christianity is gone into Christendom. And Christendom is going, and to a large degree, has already gone into Babylon. Rick Warren is directing the evangelical church into Babylon with his global peace plan, telling us that we have to unite with Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, etc., this is Babylon. This is Shinar. We can identify Shinar. Again, the Hebrew letter Shin is the SH sound. Sh, like Shirley, or She, or Should. Shinar. First element. What's the second element? The second element we have here is a woman who is called wickedness. Quite a thing. A woman called wickedness. The wicked woman. Who is the wicked woman? In scripture, wicked women 
the satanic counterfeit and satanic counterpart to the bride of Christ. As Israel was God's woman, <coughs> as the church is the bride of Christ, there's a harlot church, a false religion. The wicked women of the Bible prefigure this kind of false religion. Most notably, as we'll see in a moment, was Queen Jezebel. Others would be Delilah, <coughs> Queen Athlia, Herodias, to name but a few. Let's look at what Jesus said about the wicked woman. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 2. Jesus says this to the church of Thyatira, in Greek, Thyatira, continual sacrifice. Roman Catholicism would deny that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, teaching you must atone for your own in purgatory, and that he must continue to die sacramentally. Hence, Thyatira, the doctrine of the Mass, would emerge from this kind of apostasy and heretical thinking. Jesus says this to the church of Thyatira. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance. Nobody says that there are not well-intentioned people who do some good things in such churches as the Roman church. It's the institution that's the problem. Nobody questions the sincerity of some of the people in it. But it continues. And that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads <coughs> my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds and I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give according to each one of you according to your deeds. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would look like, Look at what a Roman Catholic world was like. Look at the Dark Ages. For over a thousand years, basically, from the time of Constantine and its aftermath until the time of the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church were the predominant churches in Christendom. from the time of the Church Fathers until the time of the Reformers. For well over a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church could have done anything it wanted and given us anything it wanted, and what it gave us was the Dark Ages. That is the Roman Catholic world. Darkness. The cultural darkness was a reflection of the spiritual darkness within it. That is a Roman Catholic world, the Dark Ages. How did this happen? Well, we see what happens. These seven churches that existed in Turkey, then the Roman province of Asia, are in succession, showing us seven ages. The last church before Jesus comes is Laodicea. But Thyatira, when Roman Catholicism predominated, the Church of Continuing Sacrifice, I will kill her children. I will throw her on a deathbed. 40% of the population of Europe was wiped out in the Black Death, in the bubonic plague. These things literally happened. 
Today we think of Muslims as radicals with a terrorist religion that use children as suicide bombers. That's true. But during the Crusades, Islam was different than it is now. In fact, Muslims were relatively civilized. It was the Crusades who were the barbarians. Under Bernard, the Roman Catholic Church sent children to die in suicide attacks in the Crusades. It was Roman Catholicism who were the religious fanatical child killers of the Middle Ages. Roman Catholicism did the same things that Islam does today. This is true. I'll kill her children with pestilence. God's judgment came on the Roman Catholic world in the Dark Ages because of their persecution of the true believers such as the Waldensians and others and the Lollards in England and because of their anti-Semitism and hatred of Israel their idolatry, all these things combined and brought the wrath and judgment of God in the Dark Ages this happened and fell. Well the same thing will happen in the last days pestilence will increase dramatically in the last days God will have had enough you're going to see increased hatred of Israel and the Jews you're going to see increased hatred of the true church and persecution by the false church and you are going to see more and more idolatry being carried out in the name of Christianity and once again pestilence and divine judgment is going to be the result but let's go further with this now the woman Jezebel she beguiles, she seduces. Jesus uses Queen Jezebel, the Phoenician pagan, wife of Ahab, to teach how spiritual seduction works. Scripture uses spiritual seduction to show us what is going to happen in terms of Satan's attempts to infiltrate the church and corrupt it from within. However, it is sexual seduction that illustrates the spiritual seduction. The woman called wickedness. It's always the same. The woman is called wickedness. The wicked woman. Jezebel. She brings pagan belief into Israel. This brings her into conflict with Elijah. That will happen again. The ministry of Elijah will come into play in the last days before Jesus returns. Jesus and Malachi made this clear. The book of Revelation shows us that one of those two witnesses will in some way be in the character and spirit of Elijah. Understand this. Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit. They all have the same spirit. They're not the same person, but they have the same character, anointing, calling, commissioning of the Holy Spirit. Elijah, Elisha, and John. Yohanan HaMatbir. Follow the pattern. The wicked woman Jezebel turned the king, Ahab, against Elijah. With John the Baptist, the wicked woman Herodias turned Herod against John the Baptist again, or against Elijah. As Jezebel turned Ahab against Elijah, Herodias turned Herod against John the Baptist, who was in the spirit of Elijah. In the book of Revelation, the same thing happens. The corrupt religious system, controlled by the wicked woman, we see in Revelation, will turn the political establishment against the people of God, bringing her into conflict with Elijah. It is a pattern. To understand prophecy, we must understand history. If we don't know what did happen, we're not going to understand what's going to happen, or even what is happening. It's what's happening. There she is. The wicked woman, Jezebel being one of them, being the main one. She seduces, she beguiles, Sexual seduction illustrates and teaches about spiritual seduction. In Proverbs, we have, in the Hebrew, a different way of 
understanding proverbs, the words of the wise and their riddles. A proverb in Hebrew is called a mashal, a mashal. It is a description of something from everyday life, be it in nature, be it in culture, be it anything. That is a mashal. A proverb is a mashal. In Hebrew, the book of Proverbs is called Mishle, the book of Mashals. In fact, in Hebraic understanding, a parable is simply an elongated Mashal. But let's go further now. While the proverb is a Mashal, its interpretation is called a Nimshal. A nimshal. You have a mashal and a nimshal. One or two examples. Like a gold ring through a pig's nose, says the Proverbs. That's the mashal. Is a beautiful woman without discretion. That's the nimshal. Like a Dripping faucet, mashal, is a nagging woman, nimshal. Like apples of gold in settings of silver, mashal, is a prudent word fitly spoken, nimshal. When you read a proverb, you're looking at a mashal. To find its spiritual meaning, you must understand the nimshal. Let's understand the mashal and the nimshal from the book of Proverbs of a wicked woman. Remember, Proverbs is God's wisdom. Secular psychology is rubbish. Biblical psychology is true. To understand human behavior, read the book of Proverbs. Forget about Maslow, Freud, Jung, and other such rubbish. It's pseudoscience and it's nonsense. To understand human behavior, read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs understands the spiritual as well as the physical and the psychological nature of man. Look with me, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 5. We see the wicked woman. Verse 1, my son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and your ears may reserve knowledge for the lips of an adulterous drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech, but in the end she's as bitter as wormwood. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not pander the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near to the door of her house. Or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. And strangers will be filled with your strength. Just like what happened to Samson with Delilah. The wicked woman, he gave his strength to others. <coughs> Sexual seduction is the mashal. Its spiritual meaning is the nimshal. Smoother than oil is her speech. False religion has a counterfeit anointing. They're smooth talkers. People like Benny Hinn, people like Joel Austin. They're smooth talkers. God loves you. God wants to bless you. Smooth. It's not a real anointing of the spirit. 
but it's smooth talking. It can counterfeit it. But then we're told something else. Her lips drip honey, but in the end she's as bitter as wormwood. It goes to death. Keep away from her because her steps take hold of you and lead you down to Shiori. The lips of the adulteress drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech. So it continues. We are also told of the wicked woman the following, that her speech is as sharp as a two-edged sword. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe knowledge. Your lips may reserve this knowledge. She knows how to talk, she knows how to seduce, sharp as a two-edged sword. Every false religion, every cult, every spiritual seduction has a two-edged sword. They have a false word of God, but it's sharp. In Islam, it's the Quran. In Mormonism, it's the Book of Mormon. In Roman Catholicism, it's the papal encyclicals chronicled in catechisms. In rabbinic Judaism, it is the Talmud. Every false religion, doesn't matter if it's the Bhagavad Gita, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Aquarian Bible, the Talmud, the papal encyclical, the Book of Mormon, the Koran, Every false religion, every cult, every spiritual seduction has a sharp two-edged sword. Therefore, we need something that is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, as we're told in Hebrews 4.12. The Book of Mormon and the Koran and the papal encyclical is as sharp as a two-edged sword. The Word of God is sharper. Otherwise, you'll be seduced. If you don't know the truth, you become vulnerable to error. Well, let's look at this further. It was recently announced a week ago that there are 50, 50 Protestant churches in the United States, some of them Baptist, reading the Koran liturgically. Reading the Quran, a book that says God has no son, which First John calls an antichrist doctrine. Why are they reading the Quran? Because they don't know the scripture. They're swallowing that two-edged sword because they don't any longer have something that is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Let's continue in Proverbs chapter 6. We read further. This woman shows up again. Verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp, and a teaching is light. Word of God is a lamp, the teaching is a light, the illumination of the spirit. Reproofs for correction are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. She's a smooth talker. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. Again, sexual seduction teaches about spiritual seduction. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife, etc., etc. There she is. Don't go near her. Keep away from it. We are told again in chapter 5 of Proverbs, do not go near to her house, in verse 8. Don't go near to her house. 
Do not go into churches that teach error and heresy. People in England should not go to Holy Trinity Brompton. They should not go to Kensington Temple. People in Denmark should not go near a church pastored by a deceiver and a false teacher like Life Monk. People in America should keep away from Joel Austin. Don't go near her house! Oh, they're smooth talking. They seem to have an anointing. It's not even real, but it seems real. Don't go near those people. Just look. Look at the deceiver life monk in your country, Denmark. I remember that man was saying things that weren't even true about the Toronto experience, trying to push it. Did any revival come to any country that embraced Toronto? No. No revival came. Wickedness only increased. In a real revival, wickedness decreases and the churches grow. We are less Christian now than we were then, and we were not very Christian then. Monk was wrong. He misled people. He was deceived himself. That's what it says about the wicked woman. She goes to destruction, and she doesn't even know it. They're ignorant people. They don't even know it's wrong. Joel Austin doesn't know what he's even talking about. Life Monk is a silly babbler. He has no idea what he's talking about. He follows the latest trend or fad because he's an ignorant man who knows nothing about this book, apparently. Otherwise, he wouldn't teach what he does and mislead people. Thank God that magazine got rid of him. I wish every church would get rid of a deceiver like him. I'll debate that deceiver anywhere in front of a camera. I'll debate that deceiver anywhere in front of a camera. You have another deceiver, another false teacher, a money preacher in... Scandinavia called Ulf Ekman. Keep away! Don't go near her house! Let's look at Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 5. That they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with their words. They all flatter. <coughs> For at the windows of my house I looked out through the lattice and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense. Passing through the streets near the corner, he takes the way to her house. Young people get sucked into these crazy churches like Hillsong in Australia, which teaches godless things like Christian women love sex and you need more money. Why? Because they're naive. Sexual seduction teaches about spiritual seduction in Proverbs. The mashal and the nimshal. Young people are particularly vulnerable. Think of the drunken sailor on leave going to a house of prostitution. Well, that's what these Christians are like, getting involved in these youth ministries that are taking them into Babylon. Things like Hillsong. Steve Chalk in England telling young people Christ did not die for sin and that we should bless homosexual marriages. These people claim to be evangelical. Then it continues, passing through the street near the corner, he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, in the darkness, behold a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. I paid my vows. Therefore I've come out to meet you to seek your presence earnestly, I found you. I've spread my couch with coverings with colored linens of Egypt. Egypt is a figure of the world. I've spread my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Again, John 19, 39, the corpse of Jesus was anointed with aloes and myrrh, anointed for burial, the way a prostitute uses cheap perfume to cover up the foul stench of what she really is, or the way that myrrh was used 
to cover up the scent of death. Spiritual seduction covers up what it really is with a false fragrance, a false worship, not a soothing aroma to the Lord. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. My husband's not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With her many persuasions, she entices him, and with flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, etc. Well, let's look at this. He's taken in by it. Notice she comes out at night. Prostitutes, street walkers hit the streets at night. It gets dark. Let us understand the biblical metaphor of the night. The New Testament and the Old Testament both use the night to teach about the approach of the Great Tribulation and what will happen during it. He's coming like a thief in the night. Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Work while you have the light, for the night will come, no man can work. Again in the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes for his bride in the night. Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes for his bride in the night. In the night the prostitute comes out. That's when it happens. Spiritual seduction increases in the last days. There have always been false teachers, false prophets, false Christs. But in the last days their numbers multiply. There's always been false doctrine, heresy, apostasy. Those things have always existed. But in the last days it multiplies. It intensifies. Things that are always true become especially true in the last days. They become amplified. This is something known in Midrash as Kal the Homer. A general truth gains weight and becomes particularly heavy. All of these things have happened before, but in the last days when it gets dark, these things multiply. We'll pick up a newspaper. It's getting dark out. Same-sex marriage is becoming normal. Churches are blessing it. Events in the Middle East are tumultuous. The stage is being set for Gog and Magog and God knows what else. What we see? It's getting dark out. He's coming like a thief in the night. So the prostitute goes to work. Spiritual seduction increases. She finds the naive youth. <clears throat> flatters him. A prostitute pretends to like her client or prospective client. All she wants is money out of him. She doesn't like him. She pretends to like him. My church in New York had a rescue mission for prostitutes. We found out about them. It was like this. Pimps were not smart people in any intellectual sense. <clears throat> they were predators. They would find girls from abusive family situations who ran away from home to New York, and they would prey on them. Many of these girls were abused or sexually abused by their fathers or something like this. These pimps would come along and buy them presents, shower them with attention and pretended affection. They became the male loving figure these girls never knew in order to seduce them. Then they would get them high on drugs, then addicted on drugs, and then they would use drugs to control them and put them on the street, destroy their lives in a few years. These were pimps. These pimps had a lot of money. They had bankrolls of money. They had customized Cadillacs and expensive automobiles. They had very expensive designer clothes. Now understand, these pimps were not clever enough to get that money or those cars or those clothes in a legitimate business or profession. 
A pimp could not make that kind of money as an investment banker on Wall Street. He's not smart enough. A pimp couldn't make that kind of money as a lawyer or as a surgeon or as a anything. They're not smart enough. They have no education. They don't even have the intellectual ability to get the education in most cases. They're just pimps. They're predators. They have a devious kind of street smarts that's predatory, but they're not smart. In fact, most of them are rather stupid. They only know how to function as predators. Well, what do they do? How do they get the money? They find this naive young girl. That's how they do it. She goes out and finds a client and pretends to like him. Prostitutes don't like their clients. Prostitutes don't even like themselves. Well, you have a situation that's like this. Money preachers, money preachers, people like Betty Hinn, Jesse Duplantis, Jerry Saville, John Avanzini, these money preachers, Morris Sorello is another one, these money preachers would never have had that kind of money if they weren't preaching it. They don't have the intelligence or ability to make that kind of money legitimately, by and large. They have to find a whore. Well, the churches who follow money preachers are their whores. Word, faith, prosperity preachers are pimps. They prostitute the word of God. And the churches that follow them are their stupid whores. That's how spiritual seduction works. Notice what the prostitute says. The man is not at home. <laughs> He's gone on a long journey. Don't worry about Jesus coming back. Don't worry about the man coming home. So you, today you see Rick Warren saying, avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Yeah, but Jesus said to be alert, watch out for these signs. Oh, forget about what Jesus said. Rick Warren says we shouldn't pay attention to it. Mark Driscoll mocks people who study it. And, and Tony Campola blames them for the world's problems. Keep away from end time prophecy. We have to think about now. Not about the coming of the Lord, not about the blessed hope. The man's not at home, he's not coming. This is all seduction. The pimp and his whore. That's what you see increasing as it gets darker and darker. Well, let's continue looking at this. So we can identify both the wicked woman and Shinar. Not hard to identify. There it is. The wicked woman and Shinar. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 17, please. It's always about the wicked woman. We see in verse 5, On her forehead, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. We continue. Verse 6, The woman is drunk with the blood of the saints. Verse 7, I'll tell you the mystery of the woman with the seven heads and ten horns, which relates to Europe, the ecumenical movement, and other things. We continue looking. The woman. It's always her. Come, I'll show you the mystery of the woman. Continuing in chapter 17, verse 18, the woman who you saw is the great city. Chapter 18, there's no chapter division in the original canon. After these things, it continues, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, fallen is Babylon. Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. All the nations have drunk the wine and passion of her immorality. 
they become wealthy with her. And it goes on, come out of her, my people. Pay her back for her sins to the degree that she has glorified herself. Her, 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 she, she, she. The wicked woman, the woman called wickedness. We can identify Shinar. We can identify the woman who's called wickedness. But now we have the third element from Zechariah chapter 5. What is that third element? The wings of a stork. The wings of a stork. Look again in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. Fallen is Babylon the great, she's become a dwelling place of demons and a prison, or in Greek, a haunt of every unclean spirit and every unclean and hateful bird. Unclean spirit, demon, unclean and hateful bird. Why does Revelation chapter 18 in Babylon, in Shinar, associate demons with hateful and unclean birds. What is this relationship between birds, unclean birds, and demons? This woman is in the ephah, which is the wings of a stork. Let's understand hateful and unclean birds. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, to the book of Leviticus, Chapter 11. What are these hateful and unclean birds? Verse 13. These, moreover, you shall detest among the birds, they are abhorrent, not to be eaten. Unkosher birds, unclean birds, that the people of God were to look upon with hatred. They are to be hated, they are to be abhorrent. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kike, the falcon and its kind, Every raven and its kind, the ostrich, the owl, the seagull, the hawk and its kind, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the pelican, the carrion vulture, and the stork, the heron and its kind, and the hoopoe and the bat. Why are these birds like vultures and kites and ravens? and storks to be hateful and abhorrent. Notice the last one listed is a bat. All of the others, it says in the Hebrew text, is according to their kind. Kind is in Hebrew the word mean, where we get the word sex. It comes from the creation narrative in Genesis, according to its kind. We would call this genus, genus in Greek. It has to do with phylogenetic classification according to what in modern terms we would understand as genotype. But the last bird is not a bird, it's a bat. A bat is a flying rodent. It's basically a rat with wings. In other words, we are to look upon these abhorrent birds, these unclean birds, the way we look upon flying rodents. Look upon these birds as rats with wings. Well, that's quite a thing. It's not according to the kind, it's according to another kind. Pay attention. Why does Revelation 18 associate these unclean birds with demons? Ephesians 6, we struggle 
not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, the powers of the air. The real enemies in the days of Zechariah were not the ones that Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai were contending with. It was not Tobias, it was not the Horonite, it was not Sanballat. It was the demonic powers on back of them. Zechariah reveals what's happening in the heavenlies when Satan was there before Yeshua and Zerubbabel at the throne of God. Clean birds and unclean birds. Kosher birds and unkosher birds. Notice that clean birds, the birds that the Hebrews could eat, that the people of God could eat in the Old Covenant, only perched in trees. They did not nest in trees. Clean birds nested terrestrially. They built nests either on the ground or on a ledge or a cliff face, even on a roof or a windowsill. Poultry, pheasant, these birds could be eaten. They were terrestrial nesters, turtle doves. They were terrestrial nesters. The unclean birds didn't just perch in trees, they nested in trees. The powers of the air. Now this only deals with the species of birds indigenous to the ancient Near East. There are other birds like the albatross, which is a huge bird, indigenous only to the Central Pacific. It's not talking about those birds, it's only addressing the birds that exist in the Middle East or existed at that time in the Middle East. The ones who were clean were birds who nested terrestrially. The ones who were unclean nested in trees. Let's continue. Secondly, the birds that were unclean were carnivorous. The birds that were clean, herbivorous. Thirdly, the unclean birds ate carrion. They were predators. They feasted on the dead. These are pictures of demons. Let's go and look at some of these unclean birds. The vulture is unclean. What did Jesus say? Where the body is, there the vultures will gather in the last days of the Olivet Discourse. They'll attack the body, carrying off members by members. An arm, a leg, a foot. In the Zoroastrian religion, they don't bury or cremate corpses. They dismember them and leave it on a cliff for vultures to come and take the members away, piece by piece, thinking they're going to heaven. The Bible says something quite different. Um, vultures are pictures of the demonic. Remember Abraham had to chase the vultures away? When he made the covenant with God and the vultures were coming to attack the sacrifice, he had to chase them. In Genesis. Where the body is, the vultures will gather. The uh, uh, ravens were unclean. Now they fed Elijah. God can even use evil for his purposes in a given situation. God can even use evil. For instance, because Judaism rejected its Messiah and created a false Judaism in place of the Torah. God could not use the rabbis to reestablish the state of Israel. He had to use secular Jews, most of whom were socialists. Had it not been for Hitler and Stalin, had it not been for the pogroms in Russia and the communist hatred of the Jews after Lenin died, had it not been for the Holocaust and Hitler, the United Nations never would have made Israel a nation. God uses evil for good. The same as the world uses good for evil, God uses evil for good. The ravens fed Elijah. But the ravens were unclean. Hitler and Stalin were bad men. They were 
demonize men. Let's look. What are the birds are unclean? The eagle. Don't eat the eagle, it's abhorrent, hateful to you. The eagles in the Middle East are highly predatory with keen vision. They swarm over a flock. Look for a lamb. Look for the smallest sheep you can find, the newborn one. Swarm down with its talons and its pinions, picks it up, flies off with it, and drops it from a high altitude, crushing its bones and its skull, then it devours it. They go after the lambs. Jesus said, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. A new believer is a lamb. Jesus carries the lambs. Because the lambs, that's the one the eagle is going to go after. It's going to pick it up, drop it, and kill it. You lead somebody to Christ, next thing you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are knocking on their door the next day. Here comes the eagles. Satan sends them. Well, let's understand this further. What other birds are unclean? They should be abhorrent to you. The ostrich is unclean. Keep away from the ostrich. An ostrich hides its head in the ground. What does an ostrich do? It hides from reality. You can show a Jehovah's Witness 10,000 times that Jesus is worshipped as God in the New Testament. The Greek word proskuto. Every time you show them that he's God, they hide from the reality. You can show a Roman Catholic 10,000 times. Forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons. God made them male and female, said it was good. You outlaw what God says is good. People are going to do something bad. You have mandatory celibacy for your clergy. Not doing something natural, like getting married, they're going to do something unnatural. You can show that to a Catholic. Look what the scripture says. It's a doctrine of demons. Look what they're doing to children in the Roman church. Hide from reality. You can show an Orthodox Jew scripture after scripture after scripture that the Hebrew scriptures prophesy about the Messiah and it all points to Jesus. I've had rabbis lose their temper with me over Daniel chapter 9. The Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed in 70 AD. I've had rabbis get angry. It says in the Talmud there's a curse on reading Daniel 9. Why don't you want to read Daniel 9? It says the Messiah had to come and die already. Hide from reality. You can show Muslims 10,000 times Muhammad was a pedophile. He was a pedophile. He married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, when she was six, took her virginity when she was nine. According to the Hadith, Muhammad was a pedophile. You can show them the Quran. What nonsense it is. That Mary, the mother of Jesus, Miriam, and Miriam, the sister of Moses, are the same woman. They lived 1,300 years apart. They lived 13 centuries apart. How can they be the same woman, Mohammed? I saw people who claimed to be born again in Denmark. You show them directly. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control.